Recently, I spent a week binging through Star vs. The Forces of Evil, and it easily became one of my favorite shows. It has great characters, a great setting, and great storytelling. Sure, the show has its fair share of problems, I'm not calling it perfect by any means, but that doesn't mean you can't enjoy it for what it is. Plus, even though it's over, there's plenty of room for theories and analysis. One character who's ripe for analysis is Toffee, the well-dressed lizard who sets out to destroy magic. And even though he dies at the show's halfway point, the consequences of his actions mean he's still the show's overall main villain. If you've watched the show, you know that there's this aura of mystery around him, especially in the first season. I mean, in his first episode, he literally appears out of nowhere. Where did you come from? I let myself in. When? After you hired me. I hired you? I accept. Even when we did learn more about him, even more questions were opened up. Well, today, I'm going to attempt to answer these questions to the best of my ability so that Toffee's plan can be understood once and for all. First things first, in order to fully understand Toffee, we need to go through his entire history, starting at the beginning. Well, not the very beginning, but as far back as we can possibly go. Meteor's lesson. Here we see a younger Toffee recruiting other Septarians into his monster army. Chronologically, this is the earliest appearance of Toffee, so whatever he did before this is pure speculation. Some people say he dated Eclipso, which is possible, but I think it's unlikely. She describes Septarians as attractively aloof. And while that certainly describes older Toffee, younger Toffee not so much. And I suppose this scene could be set during the reign of an unknown queen, but I think it's more recent than it seems. Bottom line, I don't know exactly how old Toffee is supposed to be, but I believe there's sufficient evidence to determine when this scene takes place. Pay attention to what he says after Meteora attacks him. See? This is the threat of magic! This is what we're at war against. Now that sounds a little out of place for a society ruled by a queen that possesses magic, but what if the queen never used magic? Estrella only used her wand to draw with, so that might explain why these rogue septarians are seemingly unfamiliar with the true power of magic, especially since the previous two queens mostly used magic for rather trivial purposes. Also, perhaps more importantly, Estrella's chapter mentions that the septarians are building a rebel army, but it's quite small at the moment, exactly what we see here. It's clear that by this point in his career, Toffee is already in a position of authority. How did he get there? Well, he's trying to recruit the strongest Septarians that can survive Mewen attacks, and Toffee is the strongest that we've seen. While all Septarians have regenerative powers, Toffee seemed to be exceptionally strong. He regenerates his entire body from a single finger in only 35 seconds, and it probably would have been quicker if he didn't have to leave the realm of magic in the process. Compare that to Restacor, who heals small wounds quickly but canonically took months to get his whole body back. Thus, Toffee is the strongest of the strongest species. Well, there's always Seth. Seth is an interesting character in Star vs. Lore. He never appears, nor is he ever mentioned on the show, but he appears several times in the spellbook, being mentioned in four chapters. We don't know much about him besides his extreme anti human ideology. Everything about Seth beyond that is pure speculation. I personally think he killed Solaria, which would be a fitting end for her. Seth might be dead in the present, or maybe he's alive but crystallized. At the very least, he wasn't active during Star's life, and I doubt he was physically active during Estrella and Comet's reign since the latter caused him a dried up crusty old gecko. So he spent the last of his days preaching his ideas, which were attractive to younger Septarians like Toffee. But while Seth's preachings inspired Toffee's vendetta, their goals weren't identical. For a historical comparison, I'll use Marx and Lenin. Marx developed communist ideologies and inspired Lenin to bring those ideas to Russia, but Lenin did it in his own way. You see, while Toffee hates Mumins, there's something he hates even more. Magic. Yes, most Mumins are horrible people, but not all of them. Like these guys, they're awesome. And the same applies to the Queens. Not all of them hate monsters, but they all have magic. Magic was what allowed Mumins to take control of Muni in the first place, something Toffee's clearly salty about in the present day. Princess Butterfly is reenacting our favorite holiday. The Great Monster Massacre. That is my least favorite holiday. And when he sets out to destroy magic in the present, he shows no signs of wanting to kill all humans in the process. Anyway, regardless of whether Seth died or was crystallized, he seemingly disappeared during the three year gap between his last mention and Comet's death, leaving Toffee as his successor. At some point he killed two lesser members of the Butterfly family since these skulls have been confirmed to be genuine. It's never stated who they belong to, but they're most likely queen siblings or cousins who go unmentioned in the book just because they're not important. After all, Game of Flags implies both Common and Moon have siblings, but the book makes no reference to them. But even though Toffee was very radical in comparison to most other monsters, he was still loyal to the Monster King. That is, until the Peace Treaty. Queen Comet was the most benevolent of all the Muni Queens, but since she has magic, peace wasn't an option for Toffee. 
Remember, he explicitly went against the Monster King's orders, so most monsters were fine with it. The Queen and I were about to sign a peace treaty when one of my generals went rogue. Not wanting peace, he murdered Comet, caused Moon to learn Eclipse's darkest spell, and lost a finger in the process. While Toffee wasn't afraid of Moon, his army was, which was enough to get him to retreat. His plans had failed. For now. In the Reddit AMA, creator Darren Nefsey states, Toffee was a historian and researched the butterfly family like no one had before. I'm gonna assume this occurred after he lost his finger, cause if he knew everything about the butterfly family at this point, he should recognize the spell Eclipsa designed specifically to kill his species. In the present, he definitely knows about Eclipsa's dark magic, but in the past, that doesn't seem to be the case. And it was thanks to this research that he devised a new plan, more sinister than anything Seth could have dreamed of. Toffee's initial plans failed because he was driven away by extremely powerful magic. Because of this, he comes to the conclusion that killing Newmans with magic wasn't good enough. He had to kill magic entirely. During his research, he learned many things that would benefit him in the future, like Eclipse's dark magic. I mean, if I was attacked by something like that, I'd want to know what the hell it was. Tuffy realized his contact with the darkest spell would allow him to corrupt magic at its source. It's never been officially stated how Tuffy was able to corrupt magic, but I think this is a plausible theory, especially considering what the darkest spell does to the realm in Season 4. Dark magic isn't inherently evil, but it does have destructive properties. Now, there are three known ways to enter the realm of magic. The first two are pretty standard. Either go through a portal or enter the well at the magic sanctuary. Two methods that, while simple, weren't enough. Tuffy wants to cause as much damage as possible. This takes us to the third way. He didn't just find out about Eclipse's darkest spell, but also about an even more destructive spell. The first spell, and the last spell. The Whispering Spell. At some point during his research, Toffee became aware that magic would be destroyed in the future, possibly through Selena's tarot cards and or Rhino's riddles, and he believed this prophesied destruction would be the result of his actions, a self-fulfilling prophecy. The Whispering Spell destroys any source of magic it's spoken in the presence of, and transports anyone in the immediate vicinity into the realm of magic. Toffee can't cast the spell himself, he has to get a fellow magic user to do it. But even though he has his plan in place, he doesn't act immediately. Why? Well, at this point, the only magic user powerful enough to cast such a spell is Moon, and Toffee knows that he can't win a fight against her by himself. He learned very well from their encounter that she's dangerous, and knows she won't hesitate to perform the spell on him again if the situation arises. After all, this wasn't just a demonstration of power, this was a warning. If Moon was put into the same situation Star was in Storm the Castle, destroy the wand or have a friend be killed, she'd probably try to figure out a way to save both. Unless it was this guy getting crushed. Then it would be an easy choice. But remember, Toffee's the immortal monster. He can play the waiting game. He'll wait for someone new. Someone who's more impulsive. Someone more suggestible. Someone who cares more about her friends than she does about magic. Star is pretty much the anti-Moon. That's no Moon. Moon is very proper and refined. She always takes magic and being queen seriously and is a stickler for rules and regulations. Star, on the other hand, is easygoing and spontaneous. She uses magic primarily for fun, she doesn't care about traditions, and most importantly, has a lot of friends something Moon doesn't seem to have. The strong relationships Star has with her friends are a defining part of her character. To quote her voice actress, Eden Cher, she's always messing up, but at the same time, this character has such a good heart. Star is fiercely loyal when it comes to her friends and never backs down from a fight. When Star has to choose between saving Marco or the wand, she doesn't hesitate to choose Marco. Star had no idea the wand would be split into two usable pieces, so she had every intention of destroying her family's heirloom, just so her friend can live. That's true friendship. Tuffy knows how important friendships are for Star, because I believe he's been spying on her for her entire life. How? Well, remember this all-seeing eye device from Unipendence Day? Yeah, it's suggested that Tuffy has used this before, presumably to spy on the royal family. It is the most efficient way to spy on your enemies. Tuffy learns that a simple get the wand scheme won't work because Star is strong. Moon tends to use spells in tactical ways, but Star just goes in with brute force. Note how Tuffy never directly confronts Star until Storm the Castle. Instead, he just stands back and watches. Hell, Star doesn't even know he exists until he kidnaps Marco, but I guess that's her fault for not reading the spellbook. Once Star obtains the wand and heads to Earth, he finds out about Marco and realizes he's the perfect bargaining tool. But before he can do that, another opportunity arises. Sometimes your biggest threat is right under your nose. My nose is in my beak! Mm-hmm. Ludo and his army in Season 1 are pretty incompetent. That's a known fact. Thus, it makes sense that Ludo would hire a, quote, evil efficiency expert in the episode Fortune Cookies. 
Now, I don't know if Toffee planned on working through Ludo from the beginning. He definitely knew about him since Ludo and Sara's rivalry began before she got the wand. Regardless, this opening was beneficial for Toffee since it allowed him to go unnoticed by Star. So he leaves wherever he's been hiding for the past 20-ish years, manipulates Ludo into hiring him, and gets to work. He suggests the fortune cookie plan, but I don't think he expected it to work. He was probably like, let's humor Ludo with this plan. If it works, great. If not, no big deal. He clearly isn't upset when that plan didn't work. After that, it was time to take control of Ludo's army, which required doing two things. First was getting rid of Buff Frog, the only one of Ludo's minions smart enough to realize Toffee's bad news. The second was to force Ludo into a situation to prove the short villain thinks very little of his soldiers, getting the army to throw Ludo away and make Toffee their new leader. Once Ludo was out of the way, it was time for Toffee to enact his true plan, which began with kidnapping Marco to use his bait. You're a disappointment. Yeah, well, you're boring. It was a pretty standard scenario. Bring the wand or we'll kill him. If it was Moon in this scenario, she'd take time to strategize and organize an attack force, but Star just goes for it as soon as possible. Here's the plan. We're going in on the count of one. Uh, that is not good plan. One. Once again, Toffee just waits the fight out. He knows Star can't rescue Marco, so why should he waste energy trying to stop her? It's not like she can really harm him anyway. Once the crystal cage breaks and reforms, Toffee decides it's finally time for the plan to go underway. Once Marco is in danger of getting crushed, Star finally offers the wand. But this is when Toffee gives the wham line. Well, it would be if I didn't mention it three times already. I don't want your wand. Destroy it. What? Surprise! Marco begs her not to do it, but as is already established, friends come first. Star seems to know that the whispering spell will cause the wand to explode, but Toffee is the only one who knows that it'll take him to the realm of magic. This is why he spares Star. He could easily kill her, but he gets them out of harm's way because otherwise she'd go to the realm with him. Ordinarily, the catch would be that a person's body is destroyed and as such Toffee would be stuck in the realm forever, but Toffee doesn't have this handicap. He knows his finger is out there somewhere, and he could eventually regenerate from it. All it would take is time. Meanwhile, he began working on part two of the plan. Why are you causing the fritz? What's the fritz? The leak! The reason why nothing's working up here! Huh? Once Toffee is in the realm with magic, he's able to corrupt it with his wound. Now this is a slow process, it takes a couple of months for any real effects to be noticeable, and a couple more for the process to be complete. Dark magic is powerful, but moves at its own pace, and that pace is pretty damn slow. But as I've said before, waiting isn't a problem for Toffee. I get the impression that he isn't the type of person who does things in his spare time. But he wasn't doing nothing while in the room. No, this is a multifaceted part of the plan. Huh? You can talk! Tell me your secrets. When Star performed the whispering spell on her wand, its crystal was cleaved into two halves. One was kept by Star, and the other was left behind in the ruins of Ludo's castle. This half of the crystal was initially by itself, but eventually was held by Toffee's skeletal hand. Perhaps he can control the remains of his body from within the realm. Anyway, Toffee is in control of this half of the wand, and by extension, its user. Once someone got close to the wand, he would conjure an illusion to bring them to the area, which is exactly what he did with Ludo. Now, I don't think Toffee intended for Ludo to be the one to find the wand. It could have been anybody. When Toffee says Ludo didn't have any part to play in corrupting magic, he isn't just saying Ludo didn't mean anything to him. He's saying that anyone could have done what Ludo did. The small bird man has no significance. That being said, Ludo finding the wand was useful since it gave Toffee someone he can silently manipulate. Well, silently to everyone except Ludo. I believe that if the wand was found by someone less suggestible, Toffee would have been in control all the time, like in the Ship War comic. It's established that both halves of the wand can still do magic, but it's not quite... normal. It begins to act in weird ways and responds to the user's emotions much more so than if the crystal was whole. This might be entirely due to the crystal being cleaved, or it may have something to do with the fritz, but cleaved wand crystal plus the fritz equals wand malfunction. Star's magic begins to go haywire as she experiences more negative emotions, whereas Ludo's gets stronger when the same happens, allowing him to gather a new army of rats. Quick side note, while it's explicitly stated that the wand's magic is affected by the emotional state of the user, I actually think the reverse is true to an extent. I mean, think about it, Toffee is in Ludo's wand and Ludo begins to act a lot like Toffee without even realizing it. Surprise! Anyway, once Ludo gains adequate control over the wand, Toffee begins to speak to him and says to go after Star. You see, while Toffee is free to speak to Ludo from within the realm of magic, he can't actually possess him without a large source of dark magic. The dark magic he has on his finger isn't enough. He needs Eclipse's chapter in the spellbook. 
And this works successfully. While Ludo doesn't defeat Star, he does find out about her book, which becomes his next goal. Everything was coming together. Ludo has his rat spy on Star so he can figure out the best opportunity to seal the spellbook and finds it with Bon Bon's ghost. How did Ludo know this was the perfect opportunity? Well, Toffee presumably knows about Glosseric's weird interests and thus told Ludo the book would be at the graveyard whether Star intended to bring it or not. And you all know how this goes. Marco goes on a date with Jackie, Star gets jealous, her magic acts up, she almost gets sucked into a black hole, and Ludo gets away with the book. He spends some time messing around with it, Levitato, before Toffee mentions Eclipse's forbidden chapter. Once Ludo is exposed to dark magic, Toffee is free to possess his body and is pleased to have Glosseric at his mercy after how their last encounter went. By this point, the Fritz is strong enough for the High Commission to take notice, but that's not a problem for Toffee. They'll eventually have to come to him. <gasps> that's the thing that doesn't belong! Earlier in the season, Star had to travel into the Wand in order to retrieve something which was messing up her spells. It turned out that this thing is Toffee's finger, which was seemingly teleported there after it was blasted off. The dark magic lingering on the finger messes up the spell subtly enough that its damage didn't become noticeable until then. Toffee may have known his finger was inside the wand, but it doesn't really matter since getting it out made it for easier retrieval. Sar removed the finger before she read Eclipse's chapter. If she hadn't removed the finger first, then she probably would have been possessed. And that would have made things much worse. Marco was briefly possessed by something, but the purple eyes lead me to believe that this was whatever traces remained of the monster arm and not Toffee. Anyway, back to here. Toffee lets Ludo be in control for a while until Moon and the High Commission show up. They're the only ones who have the power to stop him, and he proceeds to wipe the floor with them. But not after regrowing his hand over the wand. A hand which apparently shrinks between seasons. After he absorbs the MHC's power, not only becoming stronger but accelerating the Fritz, he finally faces Moon again after 20-ish years. Trust me, it's personal on both ends. While their fight in Starcrust is all kinds of awesome, the fact that it ends in a stalemate highlights another reason why he didn't try facing Moon until now. She's advanced considerably. While Moon certainly isn't the most powerful magic user, the fact that a being merged with all magic itself was only able to stalemate proves she's no pushover. However, something else interesting about the Undaunted is revealed here. The stoicism she regularly shows in front of her subjects? Just a front. When she comes face to face with her greatest enemy, she's clearly very scared. Not just of Toffee, but of what he'll do to her daughter. Tell Star. I'm coming for my finger. I never said the fear wasn't justified. Also, I know this is a video about Toffee, not Moon, but you really can't talk about one without discussing the other. Once again, you know how this goes. Moon tells Star she has to leave, Star confesses her feelings for Marco and dips, and Marco becomes broken. By this point, the majority of magic has been corrupted, making Star's wand begin to lose its power. Ludo's wand is fine though, thanks to Toffee's connection to magic. Star is all like, come on, let's go and fight, and Moon's like, no, we have to hide here with the finger, and Star's like, eh, I guess that makes sense. But Toffee's fine with this, he'll wait for them to come to him. He can do the dirty work himself, but it's easier to let Ludo do it. Ludo finds that he can't write in the spellbook because he's no longer the owner, and Glasserick won't tell him why. After being utterly humiliated, Ludo angrily burns the book and Glasserick alongside it. But not before the little blue man does a little trick of his own, more on that later. Toffee claims he didn't want Ludo to burn the book, but this seems like an exact word situation. Toffee says that Ludo burning the book allows him to do what he wants, so I'm pretty sure Toffee wanted Ludo to get rid of the book in some manner. Maybe not necessarily burning it, but getting rid of it nonetheless. Toffee suggests through the one that Ludo conquer Muni with his rat army, since it'll be an effective way to draw Star out of hiding. As for when exactly Toffee figured out Moon had his finger, I'm gonna say he probably starts the castle after Ludo took over. There's definitely a time skip between Ludo taking over and when we first see Ludo as king. He came to the conclusion that Moon fetched the finger before she fled. Toffee pretty much stays in the background when Ludo is king, only saying something when he tells Ludo to banish that choir because their music was off key. I don't know why, I guess he's just a man of culture. Eventually Star finds out Ludo has taken over Muni and captured her dad and sets out to rescue him, because as we all know, Star cares more about her loved ones than her own safety. And River is the most precious thing and harming him is punishable by law. <coughs> anyway, Ludo tries to kill Star when she arrives but is told she has to remain alive. Eventually, Star tells Ludo he's being corrupted by Toffee, and he asks for her to free him. Thus, Star once again casts the Whispering Spell. The castle blows up, well, part of it at least, but Star and Ludo survive. Why was Toffee's body destroyed by the Whispering Spell, but Star and Ludo's weren't? Let's say magical beings don't have their bodies destroyed. Ludo temporarily became a magic being when he fused with his wand, which also stopped him from going to the realm. Destroying the wand might seem like a hindrance to Toffee's plan, but this is what he wanted. 
Star is now his prisoner. This is when Toffee's master plan reaches its climax. Give us back, Star! Oh, of course. But I'd like something from you first. Toffee knows the only reason Moon would willingly give up the finger is if something or someone important was at stake. Moon certainly isn't a good mother, but there's no way she would let Star die, especially not to the same monster that killed her own mother. So Moon gives Toffee his finger, and what does she get in return? Nothing. He just leaves Star in the realm of magic to die. The few bits of uncorrupted magic left are too weak to do anything with. He no longer has any use for Star or Moon. He certainly has no more use for Ludo, so he just calmly walks away. He doesn't set off to reorganize his army to conquer Muni, because he doesn't need to. Without magic, Muni will slowly crumble from within. But that's just a side benefit. To him, magic is the real threat, and that threat is gone. He doesn't put that much effort into fighting off Moon and Marco. They're just minor annoyances he can brush away like specks of dust. Tuffy would have walked away unscathed if it wasn't for one tiny thing. Pudding. No, seriously, that's it. There has to be more you can tell me than that! <laughs> of course there is, but then, you're out of pudding. All throughout Book Be Gone, Glosseric tries to roast pudding into a ball. That just seems like regular Glosseric shenanigans until the very end when he's successful. Pay close attention to the pudding. Notice that it glows. Mysterious, right? Well, what about four episodes later when Star is able to restore magic using a similar glowing ball floating in Glosseric's soup? Coincidence? I think not! He wasn't roasting the pudding for the hell of it, he did it to create a failsafe, a piece of magic independent from the rest that can be used to undo Toffee's corruption because it was never connected to the realm. And because the magic came directly from Glosseric, it was easy for Star to create the new Millhorse, a Millhorse born of pudding. While this and this have never been confirmed to be the same thing, it makes sense, especially after Cleave confirmed that Glosseric's pudding has special properties. Toffee seemingly pays no mind to Glosseric's pudding ball, meaning he had no idea magic could be restored. I mean, just look at his face when Star blasts him. He was not expecting this. And while Star's blast doesn't kill him, it injured him enough so that Ludo was able to finish him off with the best one-liner ever. Only I know how this all turns out. It turns out you're dead. And thus ended Tuffy's reign of terror. Outside of a few mentions and a single time travel adventure, he kind of disappears from the series. Until the very end. So I have to destroy the magic. I guess this means Toffee was right. Surprise! <laughs> Star's decision to destroy magic casts Toffee's final words in a new light. Only I know how this all turns out. What initially came off as a standard villainous breakdown suddenly became foreshadowing. Toffee's not having a breakdown because he thinks he can keep on fighting despite his near-death state. No, he's having a breakdown because he knows magic will be destroyed, and he's incapable of accepting that he's not responsible for it. Because he is. Toffee made Moon into who she is as an adult, fundamentally changing her. This Moon would never even consider doing this. The single act of murder in Comet was the catalyst for every major event on the show, up to and including the ultimate destruction of magic. Hell, Star might not even exist if Comet remained alive since Moon and River only got together in the wake of her death. Toffee may not have been the one to destroy magic, but he's definitely the one responsible for it. A true surprise indeed. Was he right? While he is right about magic being extremely dangerous and enabling humans to persecute monsters, his motives kind of fall short since they're mostly a petty personal vendetta. Star actually had a reason to destroy magic. The Solarians were destroying Muni, her friends were injured, and the realm had been badly corrupted by the Darkest spell. Tuffy did it because he felt like it. And that's a shame because magic isn't all bad. It lets creatures from all over the universe travel and interact with each other. You can visit new places, accomplish great things, and simply have some fun. It's really a shame since Moomins and Monsters were signing a peace treaty when Comet was killed. Thus, Toffee ruined any chances of a peaceful Muni ever existing. That doesn't mean all is lost, however. While Earth and Muni becoming cleaved will undoubtedly cause some problems, there is hope for a better future. Moomins have been shown to be dependent on the Queen for everything, but now they can live productive lives. Maybe Moomins will learn a lesson from the humans they now coexist with. We also do some horrible things, but we try to overcome our faults to create a better tomorrow for future generations. Humans are humans, after all. There will be dissenters, obviously, but we can hope that everyone in this new world, created out of love, will eventually find peace. Do I think magic will stay dead if the show comes back? No. It's an essential aspect of the show, and part of its charm is lost without it. There's probably some magic still out there. Maybe Glossberg stashed some more pudding somewhere. Hopefully this will be a nicer, safer, cleaner magic. 
The forces of evil will try to get their hands on it, but as long as the forces of good are around, good will prevail. So that's my video. I know it mostly consisted of rambling, but I hope you enjoyed it nonetheless. Now I'm not saying I'm 100% correct, you're free to disagree, and I welcome you all to share your theories about Star Versus. Until next time, thanks for watching.